My name is Todd Hall, and I'm director of the University of Oxford's China Center. It's my great pleasure today to present to you another episode of One Big Thing in China Research, our series in which we ask scholars working in various fields on China to present something from their work. Today, I'm very happy to be able to present to you Dr. Zong Yuan Zoe Liu, who is an assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service in Washington, D.C. Dr. Liu works on international political economy, comparative politics, and international finance, with expertise in East Asia and China specifically. Dr. Liu has done amazing work looking at the ways in which China leverages its foreign exchange reserves, doing multiple interviews within and outside of China. And so, Dr. Liu, Welcome to the program, and please tell me, what is your one big thing? Uh, today, uh, the one big thing I would like to bring to your attention is this financial state-owned financial institution called Central Huijing. It is um, a subsidiary, or the so-called domestic subsidiary or domestic arm of this uh, well-known institution called uh, China Investment Corporation. I want to, uh, by focusing on Huijing, I want to. I want to specifically address this one question. Uh, how does the Chinese state make global markets work in favor of its strategic interest? So what is Hui Jin? Hui Jin, through my research, I find that today you can understand Hui Jin as the major uh, shareholder in chief of uh, major, most influential Chinese financial institutions. And uh, it owns major shares in a lot of this um, policy banks or state-owned commercial banks that provide a tremendous amount of financing to the Belt and Road Initiative. For example, if you look at uh, uh, the four major state-owned commercial banks, like um, Bank of China, Agricultural Bank of China, uh, China Construction Bank, or ICBC, they, they, are, they have a sh the, the same major shareholder called the Central Huizhi. And if you look at the China Development Bank, uh, which is perhaps the most important policy bank and a very, very important development financing agency today. It also has a most uh, a very important shareholder called a Central Huizhin. So from that perspective, we can understand Central Huizhin as the major shareholder in chief in China's domestic financial uh, space today. But what I also want to bring to your attention is that Huizhin itself was not created for the purpose of supporting BRI or financing or being the shareholder in chief of BRI, uh, BRI financiers. But um, Huijin was uh, created uh, rather to solve China's domestic banking crisis in the early 2000s, uh, when at one time the Chinese domestic non-performing loans in the banking system was as high as close to 30%. So in many ways, uh, the establishment of Huijin is uh, a very, very, or if not the most important part, but, but still would still be a critical part of China's state-owned or state-engineered solution to solve the problem of banking crisis. Um, because at that time, China was uh, following China's admission to the WTO, the reform of state-owned commercial banks in China became uh, a quite a pressing issue as one of the condition of China's admission to the WTO was that China, has, China had to remove restrictions over the entry of foreign banks into the Chinese domestic market. So this basically means that during the limited time of uh, 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 the implementation period, the Chinese government need to quickly remove the, uh, quickly improve the competitiveness of the Chinese banks. So under this circumstance, Huijin was created as a special purpose vehicle or special policy vehicle to recapitalize the Chinese for, uh, Failing banks. But as we see today, Huijin basically outlived it itself, outlived its original mandate or original mission, um, not became this um, uh, major shareholder in chief of Chinese uh, financial institutions. And I remember in one of my interviews, um, my interviewee told me that um, uh, right now, Central Huijin actually uh, earned itself this reputation of being the state owned financial assets supervision and uh, administration commission, uh, or the so-called uh, the financial version of a SASAC. So people might be, uh, be familiar with the SASAC, it's the state-owned asset supervision and administration commission. So um, uh, Huijin itself is the financial version of that. 
So this was established originally to put money into banks, and now where is it putting all this money? So right now, Huijin is Huijin still owns uh, the these major financial institutions. So in many ways, the channel is still there. Uh, if Huijin, if let's just say, um, God forbid, if there were a major uh, financial issue in one of these Chinese banks or Chinese brokerage firms, Huijin could be the channel to channel foreign exchange reserves from the PBOC through Huijin and into this individual uh, institution, either to recapitalize them, to restructure them, or uh, to create another new institution. And actually the Huijin model exists uh, even today. The, the, the way how Huijin was created and how Huijin outlived itself, this model still exists today. And uh, we can talk about this in the context of uh, Bottomwood Institution. So Bottomwood Institution uh, was created around two, was created for the purpose of capitalizing uh, the Silk Road Fund, which is also a major institution or financing institution for BRI projects specifically. But if you look at what, what Bottomwood is doing today, it has uh, three individual subsidiaries and uh, Bottomwood with two of its three subsidiaries, they collectively played a significant role in uh, stabilizing Chinese domestic stock market uh, around 2015 and 2016. So this channel of creating a special purpose vehicle uh, using uh, foreign exchange reserves to capitalize an existing institution or capitalize um, a new institution to influence market. This channel, this pattern exists even today. And and what? How does this then? How does this change the ways in which we understand how how China engages with the world then? So you know, uh, in terms of you know how in terms of how a state engage with the the world uh, from from finance perspective. Normally, you, we have the established model of you know the, the the U.S. as the incumbent in the international system, where um, uh, it can use coercive means to uh, sanction other countries in order to change a country's behavior. But um, uh, China does not have this kind of a privilege. You know, China the Renminbi um, does not have the dollar's exorbitant pr uh, privilege, and uh, there is no. Um, the SWIFT system is based uh, mostly in dollar, it's not in renminbi. So from, for China, from Chinese perspective, there is no such privilege of cutting some country or cutting some institution out of the payment system or out of the transaction system. So, but, so what, what China could potentially do, as we have observed uh, in news report and existing researches, re research, China can basically shut off, shut, close its own domestic market uh, by uh, restriction foreign, restricting foreign foreigners to coming inside China or uh, restricting its export such as uh, uh, such as uh, critical uh, minerals in uh, in, in, in industrial uh, output. In addition to this way, what China can and do using its own control China, when China engaging with the outside world, given that China cannot sanction others, given that China cannot uh, cut off other countries from the international system or the dollar denominated system, China can do, what China can do is to leverage its domestic capital resources and domestic financial uh, and political resources to create new institutions. And you, through these institutions, China is able to build strategic networks with influential market makers out of there. And China is able to mobilize both domestic and international capital by partnering with the international institutions to achieve government preferred or government prioritized agenda. So what you're saying is that the PRC through organizations like Huijin, um, through things like Buttonwood can then channel its foreign currency reserves mm -hmm. to strategic goals. And so this is sort of almost, you're saying, because it doesn't have as much of a stick like the United States does, mm -hmm. it has it uses carrots in terms of these financial resources. 
that it can then channel to certain preferred partners or certain states for strategic goals. Is that is that a correct reading of this? Oh, I think so. I think so. I mean, if you you you, I think that is absolutely correct. If you look at um, uh, you know where uh, I'll just again using CI uh, using Hui Jin's uh, motherhood in institution as an as a broader example, right? So if you look at Hui Jin is owned by uh, uh, China Investment Corporation and its domestic arm, and uh, uh, what what is what CIC itself or China Investment Corporation? What CIC itself does? It uh, uh, one of the major function uh, through my research. I find that actually CIC has played a significant role in enhancing China's strategic interaction or strategic connection with Western political and economic leaders. And in many ways, CIC or this Chinese state-owned financial institutions, they play a, a very important role in building strategic network with the global market makers that actually has have the power to communicate with the market to shape the market. So for you, I'll give you one, 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 one example. I, I really like this example and I, 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 I like to talk about this example all the time, which is uh, the CIC's uh, pre-IPO subscription of uh, Blackstone in 2007. I consider this case extremely important uh, for two reasons. One is because it was CIC's very first venture onto the turf of Western financial market. And secondly, it was also the first time that the China's foreign exchange reserves were invested directly in a foreign company. So from a, I, I think uh, the, so this deal, you know, uh, not only I myself like, like this, this example, I think, you know, Blackstone itself also like this example a lot, because I remember when I was uh, going through Blackstone's um, SEC filing in, I think there are 2007, a Blackstone's SEC filing listed CIC's investment, the, comp the, the, the company name uh, uh, representing CIC is the so-called Beijing Wonderful Investment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so from, a from a pure finance perspective, however, I consider this, the timing of CIC's investment in, Black in Blackstone uh, was, was questionable, to be honest. It's not only because uh, of the, you know, the obvious, the building up of risk in U.S. financial system prior to the global financial crisis. Uh, it was also because um, after CIC bought its share in Blackstone, uh, the found the two founders, uh, Stephen Schwartzman and Peter Peterson, they, the two collectively sold a combined share, something like close to uh, eleven billion dollars of share uh, as part of the firm's IPO. And I think you know this is basic finance 101. You don't sell your uh, stock unless you anticipate the price is going to collapse. So if um, if I think we all remember Blackstone's share price collapsed by almost 90% in 2009 after the financial crisis, and uh, CIC's investment in Blackstone uh, basically it did not recover until uh, March 2018, and uh, at that time it was also. Uh, when U.S. and China uh, trade war was in the uh, building up, so uh, in, by 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 looking looking back at this uh, story, it looks like CIC's investment in Blackstone in the short run it did not pay off. It did not uh, pay off at all. It you know CIC uh, suffered tremendous loss. But after uh, you know more than ten years, it was able to recoup part of its investment, and uh, more importantly. Investing in Blackstone allows the CIC to team up with the world's finest and most influential financial talent. And if you look at the CIC's later transaction uh, transaction uh, record, a lot of, like a CIC's uh, CIC's purchase of the Logic Corp in Europe and the other transactions, Blackstone actually played a lot of uh, played major a lot, uh, major uh, quite influential role. And uh, apart from these financial connections, you know, connecting with this major market maker or market movers, these people who can talk to, to the market, um, there is also this special people to people connection that CIC or Chinese leaders actually value, uh, in, value uh, from in this, uh, in this global um, financial leaders. So for example, here, again, we can consider Mr. Schwartzman as an example. So he, uh, from my interviews, I, I learned that Mr. Schwartzman, uh, he is considered by uh, many Chinese leaders and um, Chinese 
uh, academics to be one of a handful of people who can directly communicate uh, messages to senior U.S. government leaders. So, um, you know, he himself, or uh, I mean, Schwarzman, Mr. Schwarzman himself, he shared the lunch with Chinese uh, President Xi during the 2007 Davos um, Forum. So it was this kind of people-to-people, -people, strategic people-to-people -people connections that uh, Chinese-owned, government-owned investment institutions that can help build. It, this, this is a tremendous amount of asset that cannot be achieved otherwise. The government itself cannot simply go out and say, I want to build a relationship with this and that. This is simply not achievable. And the government can also, can, could not also could not establish new rules, new regulations by controlling foreign market and say you have to do this, otherwise I'm not I will you know impose sanction on you or do something else. So basically the story here is that for China, given that China does not necessarily have the coercive power, doesn't using your word, does not have the, the stick, instead China can leverage its domestic political power and the domestic financial power to creating new institutions and using these institutions to build a strategic network around the world so that it can shape market um, in order to achieve its strategic agenda. And um, uh, so the, 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 the CIC uh, Blackstone is just one example. And there are also other examples where, you know, CIC, CIC, CIC partnered together with other institutional investors along the theme of BRI. And uh, uh, in many ways, CIC also broadened uh, the, 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 the theme of BRI. If you look at BRI as, you know, China making um, a mega infrastructure investment in um, developing countries, C CIC actually have achieved was so far has been being able to partner with advanced economies to set up bilateral cooperation fund or bilateral industrial cooperation fund and things like that to broaden Chinese investment in foreign countries. And one such example is US-China industrial cooperation fund. So it is this kind of strategic networking function and the capital, cap, uh, capital mobilization function that allows the Chinese state to be able to make global market work, if that makes sense. No, this is fascinating because what you see in the news, of course, is this constant focus on debt traps and yes. large infrastructure projects and these types of things. What you're saying is there's actually a completely different way in which this is working and that there's these institutions that are actually using Chinese foreign reserves and they're using them strategically, but not in the way that we've seen much of the media focus, but rather to set up these, these networks and these relationships not in countries along Chinese periphery, but but in countries in, in what would be called sort of the North America, Europe, et cetera, the West, and with exactly. actors who are actually major market players. Exactly, you're absolutely right. Well, that's fascinating. And so if we want to know more about this, where where would we look? To... So I am uh, making this into a book and hopefully um, this will be uh, published next year and I will keep you updated about this book. And uh, I also hope to use this opportunity to uh, promote my, my other work that is going to be published this year by um, uh, Cambridge University uh, Press. Uh, that is more along the lines of, um, uh, uh, it's the same line uh, on China and the international finance, but it's more about uh, China and uh, in the context of BRICS and uh, the de-dollarization activities. Very good. So everyone, please do keep a lookout for that. And thank you for joining us. That concludes our episode today. If you are interested in further episodes or in other activities of the China Center, do please check us out on our website or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Thank you very much and goodbye.